from Chicago's Can TV. A look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to the show. It's Chicago Newsroom. I'm Ken Davis. And you know, the election is coming. Yes, that critically important election between the affable but maybe not as effective as you'd like incumbent and the wealthy, hypersensitive, competent challenger with all the money. But you know what? This is Chicago, and let's face it, our eyes are already focused on February 24th, 2015. It's the election for mayor. And when Rahm Emanuel faces the voters, one of the main issues he's going to be judged on is how well he handled the schools. Will he be able to say that he made them better? Will his push for longer school days, more so-called teacher accountability, more arts in the classroom, more school choices, mainly charters, of course, Will all of that sell with the voters? Well, it's been a while since we did an all-school panel here on the show, so this week we've invited three of the people I most respect for their knowledge of school system, the school system, CPS, and everything else, to so sit down with us right here and talk about Chicago public schools and about politics. And that would include Lauren Fitzpatrick, who is with the Chicago Sun-Times. Great reporter. Good, good to have you here. Nice Thanks to be for here. coming back. Mm -hmm. Sarah Karp is back again from Catalyst Chicago and a familiar face here on the show. And Wendy Catton is joining us again from uh, uh, Raise Your Hand, Raise Your Hand Illinois, Raise Your Hand CPS. Raise Your Hand Illinois. Just make sure your hand Just is raised. Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and I should say that we have you on because you're not exactly a journalist in no. the sense that these guys are but you do journalism. You, you yeah. have been uh, working as an activist and you've been publishing a lot of very important numbers and reports and uh, we've, all of us have relied on you for your information for a really long time. So I'm glad Thanks. to have you all here. Thank you. Um, so what we've arranged today is to spend the entire half hour talking about hot dogs. Uh, were, you, <laughs> <laughs> were you in line? Did you get a, did you get a hot dog? <laughs> I, I've just been amazed at the ability of that one little sausage okay. shop to dominate the Chicago media for over a week. I mean, it's just, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. So, And we should also start with a, a serious note that um, by the time you see this show, you will know more than we know because we're taping at 1030 in the morning, but there's going to be a press event this afternoon over at the CTU to talk about Karen Lewis's health. and. We, as we're speaking, don't know what, what they're going to say, so we'll move on without that. But I think uh, all of us uh, wish her the best and hope that everything is going to be all right. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the schools. Um, the thing that occurs to me the most, I mean, the, the, the thing that sort of ties a bow on everything, is that the numbers at CPS are dropping precipitously. I mean, the, the enrollment is just going mm -hmm. down, down, down. I, it, it doesn't appear to be because so many people are leaving the city. I don't think that's what it is. They're going into Catholic schools. They're going into private schools. I, I don't know what's going on. Somebody help me. What's going on? Maybe they are. Maybe some are leaving the city. You know, you hear a lot of the parents talk about how they don't feel like there's there's good options for high schools. I I hear parents say that they were going to take off right before high school. So I think that's some of it. Um, but I also think that you know there's some neighborhoods that are still draining people you know a lot a lot of the south side neighborhoods um low-income neighborhoods are just don't have many people and they're just leaving mm -hmm. um but i do think this speaks a lot about mayor Emanuel's performance because the fact that people aren't signing their kids up for the schools whether they're going to um, private schools whether they're going to suburban they're leaving for the suburbs you know it, it shows that they're a vote of non-confidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. I, I, from what I've seen, and, and you guys are the experts on this, I, every, I, I, virtually everything I know, I know from reading your work. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I don't do original reporting. I just sit here and talk about what you guys do. But the, um, the numbers don't seem to be just from like where the 50 schools were closed. I mean, no, in, in Portage Park yeah. is, I mean, in I places where you yeah. wouldn't expect. I mean, I talked to the um, LSC chair at Portage Park where um, you know they were not really affected by the closings. It's on the northwest side. I mean, she lost dozens and dozens of kids, mm -hmm. and talked about how um, some of the families, um, you know, the economy is a little bit better, so some of them moved to Catholic school because mm -hmm. they could afford to do so. Mm -hmm. um, some of them just up and left the city because they also could afford to do that now mm -hmm. too. I mm -hmm. mean, 
they lost like 75 or 80 kids. It's, it's, a, it's a ton. It's but all, I mean, I, the, just, just to pick on them for just a moment, I mean, my sense of it is that that's a pretty good school, right? I right. mean, it's not, it's not the kind of school that you would be standing in line to get out of. I don't, I mean, that's, that's not the impression I have. It's, yeah. it's a solid little neighborhood right. school yeah. in yeah. a solid little neighborhood. I don't think we can get the exact numbers of the population changes, but um, we do know that the CPS projected last year that they would have 405,000 students, and those were projections that they made based on some data that they had, and now we're at 397. So we know that the projections were way off and that 6,000 students have left the system in two years. And I think that's very telling. And it is, it, if CPS releases that school information, uh, I think we'll see that it's all over the city mm -hmm. that their enrollment uh, declines. One thing that, that might be interesting in the data is looking at how the charter schools fared. So mm -hmm. did they make their projections? Yeah, yeah. Because we're, we're hearing you know, people say that, they, that they're getting calls from charter schools right now. Um, and and you mean that like come to our school. Come to our school. Like we still have openings. <laughs> come mm -hmm. on. I mean, sure. I, I, I heard about two or three people over just the last couple of weeks. So that leads me to believe. And this, these were some of the really good, relatively good charter schools, mm -hmm. the ones that you would think are, were performing. So that leads me to believe that there's there's some issue there where mm -hmm. they didn't make their their numbers either. And you know. I think that when CPS projected that there was going to be 397,000, they were thinking that those charter school seats were filled. Now, if those weren't filled, it might be less than 397,000. Well, there's obviously something I'm missing here. That number, the 400,000, mm -hmm. that, that includes charter schools, mm -hmm. right? They're CPS schools. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so the, I mean, okay, all right. So, so that's not, it's not because people are leaving the traditional schools and going to charters. I mean, that, because right. they're all in the same pool. Right. But when you keep opening thousands and thousands of seats every year, mm -hmm. how can anyone meet their enrollment? I mean, right? Mm -hmm. They've opened, right. 20, the district's opened 21,000 new seats in the past three years. So this is, I mean, this is crazy. We're, we're talking about the overall pool of kids in the schools is shrinking. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we're expanding the number of, that's such a weird term, seats, but I the, know. the number of <laughs> spots? Spots, spots available <laughs> for kids to sit in, yeah. Um, so, so what we had thought at one time was that the, the charters might be draining kids away from the traditional schools. Is that still happening or do we know? I'm sure in some neighborhoods it is, and I'm sure in other neighborhoods it's it's not. I mean, like Port of, Portage Park does not have a ton of charter schools around there, and at least no, not really new ones that I can really think of. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's probably you know just people choosing private schools or suburbs. Mm -hmm. But then in other areas, like let's say South Shore, where they have a charter school that opened, um, I think last year, and they also have a bunch of neighborhood schools that are that have space available that type of dynamic you're going to you know find this push and pull between kids mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i mean i think you make a really good point sarah that that we opened the show by saying that we kind of want to focus uh, to have a, a sort of an underlying theme of today's show you know, how's he doing how's how's mayor emmanuel doing and this is a kind of a vote i guess in, in a way this is like a pre-election vote it's like four thousand people or more have said we're so unhappy we're just going to take our kids out of the system altogether that's a lot it is. And it, I think it also ties into all of the other things that are going on in the city because if you look at like places like South Shore and, and Woodlawn where I live, you know, I, th I think that crime is sort of intertwined with um, and the high unemployment rate. I think those are other reasons why people are leaving the city. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the schools might be suffering and it might, you know, show that they're, they're losing kids, but people, you know, people are just sick of it. They're sick of you know, the hearing, maybe deaths are down, but shootings are not down. And so mm -hmm. you're hearing gunshots, you're, you know, seeing police speed down the streets. Mm -hmm. You're thinking, why am I still, yeah, why am I still yeah. here? Mm -hmm. I, this has nothing to do with anything, but every time I hear that statistic, I think about a story that uh, Ted Cox did in DNA Info a couple of years ago about how dramatically the Chicago Fire Department has improved its ability to get to the scene and, and get people yeah. to, to, you know, mash units so quickly that they're just saving many, many, many more people than they ever were before. And if 
if we didn't have that, the death number would be way higher than it is. But, mm. th but that's for another show. Uh. <laughs> so um, I'd, like, I'd like to sort of focus for a second on this Hancock High School story. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, I find this really fascinating on so many different levels. First of all, I have to admit that here I thought I really kind of understood this stuff. I'd never heard of Hancock High School until two or three weeks ago. No, I hadn't either. Oh, good. <laughs> then I don't <laughs> feel quite so bad. Mm -hmm. um, but Hancock High School apparently was doing fairly well, and then it just suddenly got announced that it was going to be converted into a, um, a selective enrollment school. Yes. Nobody knew they were even talking about it. Um, <laughs> very few people knew that they were talking about it. And I mean, I guess a lot of us knew that the aldermen had been making, Ar Alderman Marty Quinn, the 13th Ward, had been making a case since at least March publicly that like my kids on the southwest side need access to selective enrollment too mm -hmm. because we're putting mm -hmm. them on buses and L's and they're spending two and three hours a day just getting back and forth. Some of them aren't going to the selective enrollment high schools they're getting into because the parents are saying the commutes are just too it's far. Just brutal, so yeah. if we're going to have this selective enrollment thing in the city and everybody else has access we, we need one too, so mm -hmm. let's figure out a way to bring it to the southwest side. So we all kind of knew that was being discussed by Mo yeah. Alderman Quinn. So on the near north side, when they need a selective high school, Rahm Emanuel decides that he's going to take away a park and build a brand new Barack Obama high school. But on the southwest side, they take a school that apparently is improving <laughs> dramatically and doing fairly well and say, oh, you'll be that. And the federal government just sank six million dollars into to make it into a stellar neighborhood school. And it's by all accounts, it, 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 I mean, I wrote a story last week getting at what's going away here. Like, mm -hmm. what are we giving up in order to mm -hmm. equalize access to right. selective enrollment? Right. And I mean, they did just spend the six million dollars. They've got a dynamo of a principal. She loves her staff. She carefully has assembled them over the last few years. Like she's got a great working school mm -hmm. that is open to anyone who lives in the neighborhood. I mean, if you can get in the door, they will take you and educate you in this great place. So she gets to stay put, which is great for the kids who do get in the door, but it's not going to be the same kids from so the it's footprint. essentially a school closing in a way, in my view, of a neighborhood high school that's working for kids. And your paper <laughs> editorialized today against it, saying this is it's not smart because what you're doing is you're making the parents in that neighborhood who have access to a decent local high school choose now uh, between that or the, the selective enrollment. And, and the kids who uh, kids in the neighborhood who had access to that school, many of them will no longer have access to that school, right? Mm -hmm. Most of them will no longer Most have access. Them. So. <laughs> In a way, Wendy's right. You're kind of destroying a local, uh, a good functioning local high school. And the point that your editorial makes is that there are plenty of other schools around that could be dramatically improved and made into it. Right? Well, Gage Park is like virtually empty. Really? But people don't want. The, there's a difference because people don't want to have to go to Gage. Gage Park is in a different neighborhood than Hancock. Hancock is sort of a much more, um, like middle-class neighborhood so you're gonna get more people wanting to travel there because the other thing is there is not a, a, a selective enrollment high school right there however Lynn Bloom is not so far it's not so far. It's, th it's just that people don't want to travel into England. so we get into so, the, so we get into uh, that, that situation there's a, there is sort right. of a but there, this is you know there is some need for that there because if you think about it there's not a selective enrollment high school in a predominantly la Latino neighborhood mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of them serve a lot of Latino kids, but so that, I mean, you can see the need for it. The The question is, is that when those kids don't, the kids that don't get in, are they gonna wind up in overcrowded schools? I mean, Curie doesn't have a lot of room. Curie's one of those schools. Which one was Hubbard, Hubbard was another one. I don't think they have a lot of room. They're all like 105%, mm -hmm, 107% mm -hmm. at capacity. So are you gonna take kids out of a school where, you know, they have space as a decent school and send them to a place where they're, you know, stuffed in like sardines? But the kids who were going to go to Hancock and in the next generation and can't go are faced with a bunch of schools that are already at 110, 115, 120 percent right. enrollment, right? Yes. Yes. So, again, bringing it back to our theme, how well is our mayor handling uh, these these situations? This really does sound like a kind of a weird 
um, sister relationship to the whole Obama High School thing. It's like, how is the planning done for this? And why, why are why are the people in the neighborhoods the last to learn that their schools are about to be overturned in some way? Such a good question. Yeah. Such a good question. We've been trying to get at that question for since what? I mean, you since, since 2011 <laughs> at least. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for never. the last couple of years. Yeah. I mean, the outcry about the high school on the southwest side really came to a head after the Obama prep mm -hmm. school was announced, and then the southwest side was like, well, wait, you do have money for another one of these. <laughs> yeah. You're just right. like putting it here. <laughs> right. 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 Well, you're not putting right. it in Obama's neighborhood. Right. You're not right. putting it anywhere on the south side. We need one. Like, what the heck is going on yeah. here? Yeah. So wait, uh, up springs a political problem, which yeah. now maybe politically has been taken care of. Yeah. I just want to add, I understand the point of view of parents or people on the southwest side who feel left out, but I do think that um, given, you know, that excellent piece on sorting that's going on mm -hmm. by WBEZ that I think more people need to ask why do we need selective enrollment high schools and how do they work towards the overall health of our system mm -hmm. and looking at other districts around the country. I don't think anyone has what we have in terms of sorting, stratification, and all of these. I mean, I get it if everyone else has one, sure, but I don't, this, I don't think this is a healthy uh, maneuver yeah, <laughs> for the, 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 the overall well-being of, of our, our city. Being that, that um, as, you, as you build more and more of these selective enrollment high schools, the high schools that are left behind get left more and more and more behind. Absolutely. Their, their enrollment drops, their resources and facilities That's drop. Absolutely. It's not as interesting a place to work as a teacher, so you get, yeah. you know, everything begins to deteriorate. Absolutely. Which is we're talking to Sarah Duncan of the Network for College Success, which is just so very interesting. Um, you know, she's with this group at the University of Chicago that partners with different neighborhood schools to just get more of their kids to to get to college and to improve them. So mm -hmm. she, her group had partnered with Hancock during this $6 million <laughs> um, federal improvement grant. And her point at the end of all this was that like, Hancock is what you want. Hancock is what the district should be replicating. Right, right. You, selective enrollment and choice are things you want when the system isn't working. When yeah. you don't have good choices, then yeah. you want more choices. But when you have a great choice right here, Selective enrollment is not what you want, and how nice is it to just know that your child can walk across the street or three blocks mm -hmm. away from home, and your child's going to be perfectly fine and get a wonderful education. That's such an interesting point, that, that in a way, a system that has selective enrollment high schools is essentially admitting that it is not a very good system because the, there's so much pressure from the parents that they want something better, so you just have to go outside and build something else outside for them. And Sarah, that turns into something that you reported yesterday in Catalyst, which I, I think is really interesting and sort of related, is that some of the big, wealthy, selective enrollment schools and other, you know, just, just the top cream schools, they can, imply, uh, they can impose all kinds of fees on their parents. And what was it I and saw? And they do. <laughs> Whitney Young raised $680,000 outside of the budget. This is like off the budget money, right? Right, right. They charge $500 per wow. student. And you can't get a waiver if you're free or reduced lunch, but, you know, the actually there's smaller percentages of kids with free and reduced lunch in, in a lot of the selective enrollment schools, so you, you can pull in, pull in that money. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's not just Chicago. In, in some of the wealthy suburbs, they charge these big fees. I talked to, I, I did this story um, with the BGA where, with the, with the story I did with them, I focused a lot more on the suburbs, but um, in some of those suburbs, they'll actually send collections after you if you don't pay your <laughs> fee. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So, oh, I mean, yeah. you know, this is, this is intense, this yeah, is intense yeah. stuff. And, um, you know, it's, a, it calls into question of what is a free education, but the mm -hmm. other thing is that it just, it just, you know, exasperates an inequality between schools because, you know, when you, when you get $680,000, even though they do have a ton of kids there, you know, you can buy a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. You can do things, that's, mm -hmm. that's unencumbered money. It's not money that you have to, like, you know, fill out a grant form with yeah. or, yeah, you know, tell somebody, door. right, and yeah. so you can do things with that, yeah. and, and it makes the, the education different. I thought it was so interesting that you, um, I think, very skillfully compared it to Manly High School, which is only really, I mean, as the crow flies a couple miles away, they raised 8,000, was that, is that right? <laughs> 8,000 like as opposed to 680,000. <laughs> 
And, you know, it's like these, these are kids whose parents can't come up with 500 bucks for, you know, the technology surcharge or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, what does it mean? What does it mean when you have, it, it, you have this, this incredibly disparate situation between schools that aren't even that far apart, but as we know as Chicagoans, they're a million miles apart because of the difference in the neighborhoods. What, what, how, do we, how do we react to that? Well, I mean, it means that no one's looking or not enough people or the right people are figuring out the funding needs for students. And so schools become desperate and they do what they can to raise money um, because they've seen budget cuts for years. And so if they have parents who have the money and are willing mm -hmm. to pay, they're doing these things. And it's hard to tell a school that had X, Y, and Z and lost money, or you know, sometimes schools have switched over from being Title I schools to not, and they're losing money, to tell the schools, well, just give up that program if mm -hmm. they have the parents there who can pay. That doesn't make it right, yeah. and it's yeah. all these unintended you know, consequences, but the overall issue is that no one's talking about how to improve funding in our state, mm -hmm, <laughs> in our mm -hmm. city for education, and so we're stuck with um, all of these gross inequities. Well, it, it, it brings <laughs> to mind uh, the, whole, the whole discussion about the so-called student-based budgeting. Um, Kate Grossman from your editorial board was on the show a few weeks ago and, and we talked about this and, and she said that, that uh, I'm gonna grossly paraphrase her now, but, but the essence of what I think she said was that by doing the student-based budgeting where the money follows the kids into the schools and your budget is developed by that, that's the thing that empowers all of this kind of choice, the charter schools and everything, because you, you've created a situation where you're almost guaranteeing that a whole stratum of these schools are just gonna become impoverished because they, they, they can't possibly compete. How can Manley compete with Whitney Young? And if you say that they're the equal and they're both gonna get the same amount of money, it's nuts, it's just completely nuts. But interestingly enough, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen that they've kind of backed away from that and now they're saying that schools, well, you tell me what they're saying, I don't know. I, they're saying that um, whatever we, CPS, projected you to have for your budget this year, whether you lost kids or not, you're gonna get to keep your money. Mm. They did this last year because it was like kind of the trial run of the whole thing. So mm -hmm. you could see this could be how bad your budget might be. Right, but, right. you know, Barbara Bird Bennett got on the phone with all of us and said, like, no, no, we'll, we'll give you some time to figure this out for this transition. But she also said, and then she said again this past yes. summer, this is it. And this she had it. her total, like, teacher principal voice on, too. Mm -hmm. Like, you knew she was serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is not going to happen again. So uh. learn what you can move on. She, I know she said it earlier this summer, but I can't remember what call yeah, we were on yeah. when she yeah, said, yeah. it's coming and it's going to be ugly. And then all of a sudden, it's not going to be ugly. It's not coming. It's not coming. I, I, you don't, you're not suggesting or implying in any way that it's because it's an election year, are you? No. No, okay. Well, oh. I, I will. But I will. <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, will you? <laughs> sure. Absolutely. I don't think we'll be getting this uh, announcement next year uh -huh. at this time. Well, but, but really, the, I guess, again, the question in the context of mayoral politics is, is this, not a, is this not an admission that this system doesn't work, that it's a failure, this, this, this student-based budgeting notion? Well, sure, but who cares, right? I mean, yes, <laughs> but, but I mean... Yes, but thing, we see things change year to year. And, um, you know, we saw longer days, money uh, given to the schools. Every school got a position, and then they were yanked away the next year, and then you got half back the following. So, you know, this is a year to year thing based on the timing, I right. believe, of, of campaign cycles. And this is the year to ask for things. I yeah. mean, this is, yeah, I'll this say is the year to ask. Very good point. I mean, this Remember that. The student-based <laughs> budgeting is one example. Right. There's, there's sort of a really minor example of Diet High School, mm -hmm. where they've been asking for lots of things, including a right to sort of form their own school. But they've also been asking for these little tiny things that for the last couple of years they've been denied, such like as- a gym teacher. Well, I mean, <laughs> can we go through the front door again? Yeah. You keep mm -hmm. making the kids go through the back door. Yeah. Can we go through the front door? Could we have a prom? Could we do 
some things that really don't cost the district anything. And all of a sudden, a few weeks ago, they were told, of course you can have all these things. Yeah, yeah. And this we is a school care. that's oh. being closed. This is a you school can that's go through the front yeah. door. Yeah, yeah. 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 like 12 <laughs> people in it, so, or 13 people. <laughs> I want to go to that prom. So that sounds yeah. like an exciting prom. I mean, yeah. Yeah. 26 people. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's a minor concession at one school where there are, yeah. right, are yeah. 12 yeah. or 13 children, yeah. but they've been asking for this for a few years. And now is the time that they're being told, sure. But, but we that's also so sad that those are the standards. Yes, mm -hmm. you can go through the back door and have a problem. Well, the standard is wait till it's an election <laughs> year and, and demand right. it, and maybe you'll get it. But but <sighs> isn't it the same thing with this weird announcement that or, or non-announcement that they're not going to authorize any more charter schools next year? I mean, isn't that the same the same kind of thing of just admitting that you know maybe this thing is getting out of hand? We if we've got to face the voters, we better be able to say we're not doing any more charters. It's, it's a perverse thing. There's also a reality. I mean, the budget is not there to open more charters and not close more schools. Mm -hmm. And they promised they weren't going to close more schools. So they just, I mean, just financially, I don't know how they can just keep along this path. I mean, they're going to have to, you know, close a, a slew of schools if they expect to keep opening, char you know, 10 charters a year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, probably next year only two will open. I mean, that's my prediction. There's a, a couple others that were delayed. I don't think they're going to open. I don't think Uno's going to open any new ones. They could open two. I don't think Learn's going to open. I, I don't think that, I don't know about Aspera. They're supposed to be building a high school, but I don't know where that is. So, I mean, I really think only two charter schools are going to open, which is, you know, unprecedented since the start of Renaissance 2010 and 2004, where there's always been a clip about, you know, at least at least more than five. Mm -hmm. So, are are the are parents voting with their or not voting with their feet by not moving to the charters in the numbers that everybody thought they would? Is that is that happening? Can we sense whether that's happening or not happening? I don't think we have the numbers yet. I know last year we crunched some numbers and found there were 11,000 open seats in charters, but I, I don't know what it will be this year. Yeah. And I think there's a difference in different charter schools. I mean, I still think mm, Nobles are getting a lot of kids. Mm -hmm. I think maybe some of the cachet around Unos, maybe they're not getting as many kids. I mean, they've been in the news sort right, of negatively. Right, right. Um, there's a, some of these new operators that I just don't know how they're doing, like intrinsics or foundation, not foundations, like Great Lakes. I don't know how they're doing. Um, but as I said, you know, some of these ones that I think um, are good, that I have always thought to be decent ones, like the Global Citizenship Academy, they're still calling people, asking for people to enroll. So that makes me very yeah. interested in what's going on. All right, we have 25 seconds left. Is um is the longer school day, does it actually exist? Is it working? Around the table, five seconds each. Wendy. It's just, it's not a real reform. It could, it probably works in some schools where you can't talk about the length of the day without what's happening in the school day. So it's, yeah. <laughs> yes, longer, not necessarily fuller. Right. And, and less time for teachers to plan and collaborate, which every expert says is very important to making a better school. So there aren't going to be a lot of people who are going to say, I can't wait to get to the polls to vote for Rahm Emanuel because he gave me the longer school day, is what I think I hear you, all three of you saying. No. Maybe. All know. right. <laughs> well, that's it. we got to run. It's really, I just thoroughly enjoy talking to you guys because there's so much going on in this thing, and it's a very interesting topic. Thank you, Lauren Fitzpatrick from the Chicago Sun-Times. Thank you, Wendy Catton from Raise Your Hand, Illinois, and CPS. <laughs> and thanks, Sarah Carp from Catalyst. Thank I'm Ken Davis. You've been watching Chicago Newsroom. It's a community service of Can TV. You can watch us, uh, you can find us here on cable, but, you know, anytime at all, you can watch us, this show, at this address, and you can check us out on iTunes also, and I hope you will. We'll be back next week with another show. Thank you very much for watching. And um, yeah, just come on back sometime. Bye. <laughs>